I don't understand why this child acts like this. How many times have you said that or thought that? A lot, right? Whether it's kids in your group or kids in your home, it's hard to understand why people do the things that they do. So let's talk about why they do it. Now, understanding why they do the things they do doesn't give us a magic uh, you know, wand to solve the problem, but it helps us stay a little bit calmer and sometimes it helps us decide how to react. So we use the brain state model to help understand what's going on inside their body and inside their brain. And when we try to understand where a child is at, we're also learning what's happening inside our own body and our own brain. It helps us recognize where we're at and where the kids are at so we can figure out what they need. So there's three brain states. The survival state is way in the back. That's our lowest brain state. It's the first one that we have. It's the survival state. The second one is our emotional state, right? So this is a little better. We're climbing up a little bit. And then there's our executive state right in the prefrontal lobes. That's exactly where we need to be to learn new things or to to even access the skills that we've been given, right? So all this time we spend telling kids what we want them to do instead of throwing or kicking or screaming, we're usually telling it to them when they're in one of these lower brain states. They can't absorb it. We need them to be in their executive state to hear us, to learn what we want them to do next time. So way at the bottom, survival state. It's our base. It's the first one to come online when we're born. And while when we're talking about brain states, it's the least desirable place to be, it's also really, really important. It represents our most primitive self, right? Babies cry to be held, fed, and changed. They cry to get their basic needs met. So babies go into their survival state because they don't have the words or any other ability to, to say, hey, I need help here. And then back in the day, like way, way back in the day, it told us to run when we saw an animal like saunter into our cave. Today, it's what happens when someone um, pulls out in front of us and we swerve immediately to miss them. So we want our survival state, right? We don't want to be really thoughtful and plan out how we're going to swerve our car to miss the, the person that's just pulled out in front of us. We need to react quickly. So that fight flight or surrender, you know, and you know the feeling, right? Like think about the last time you were like got into an argument with someone or someone really upset you and you feel your heart beats a little faster and you're like flooded with that adrenaline, right? Maybe it makes your stomach feel um, queasy. That's survival state. Survival state asks one question, am I safe? It's designed to keep us safe. The survival state looks like all, all of these things. And in school age kids, the most that you're going to see, and you already know this, is fighting, right? Sometimes there's running. Sometimes there's physical fits, especially with your younger ones. Um, you might see them shutting down or giving up, right? This is, this is when they've completely given up and they won't respond to you, right? Sometimes it's crying. And then in us, when we are in our survival state, we can do all of those same things, but at work, it probably looks like ignoring the behavior, giving up, I'm tired of this kid doing this, I'm just going to completely ignore it and walk away, right? Busy work. Uh, um, uh, take my phone out, right? B busy work. I got to stock the forks and uh, get this thing out of the closet and organize this paper instead of being with the kids. Um, it's cell phones, right? Like raise your hand if you escape while you're working by looking at your cell phone. 
you're probably with your supervisor, so maybe you don't want to raise your hand. But we all know that we do it or we know people who do it when things get stressful, staff look for ways to escape. We all do it. It's survival state, right? It's hiding in the bathroom, survival state. So when we're in survival state, we cannot offer any solution to the child. We can't comfort them, we can't breathe, we can't download our calm because when we're in the state, we have nothing to offer to make someone feel safe. We only have access to those skills that we just talked about, the escape, the hiding, the shutting down, right? In survival state, our kids can't learn and problem solve. They cannot listen to reason. They cannot listen to our lectures or our threats. A person in this state needs to know that they're safe. It's their only focus and they can't put resources towards anything else until they understand that they're safe. And this is important. It's perceived safety. So we think of safety is like you've got a roof over your head and no one is physically harming you. So we look at the kids in our groups and in our programs and we think, of course you're safe. That's like our whole job, right? We have ratios, we do supervision, like you're safe. We're keeping you safe. It, for the child, it's perceived safety because most kids don't think about what you're doing to keep them safe. They don't care about ratios and, and you know what supervision looks like for the DHS. It's how they feel inside, right? Think about an adult that you don't feel safe with. Maybe they don't physically go after you, but there's probably someone that we can all think of that we don't feel safe with, maybe safe talking about our emotions, maybe we don't feel safe telling them our problems or asking them for help. We've all got someone in our life like that. So we don't want to be that for the children in our care. It's their perceived safety. We don't get to decide what safe looks like for them. So what they need from us when they're in their survival state is us to download our calm. And that just means that they are young and they do not yet have the ability to calm themselves, right? We talk about self-soothing. I just had a conversation with a parent last night about um, their uh, child not being able to self-soothe. But self-soothing isn't a child has learned to comfort themselves and feels really great. A child has learned that we're not coming and there's no point in crying. Um, so they don't have the ability to talk themselves through, I'm okay, I'm safe, this is going to be okay. I'm just going to take some breaths. They need us to do that for them. And when we're spazzing out because of their behavior, we can't do that for them. So we need to stay calm and then we need to download it to them. Just be close, blending our breath, letting them know that they're safe. I'm here to keep you safe. Sometimes it's literally saying that out loud. I've got you. I've got you. I'm here to help you. I've got you. And sometimes it's letting them know that you understand this is really hard, but you can handle this and I'm here to help. Our next brain state is emotional state. The emotional state is triggered when the world isn't going our way. This is the most common emotional state that you will find the children in your care, and it is the most common state that you're going to find yourself in when things are going bananas in your group. The emotional state is triggered when the world isn't going our way. Now, for us as adults, like we've kind of learned over the years that lots of things cannot go our way and like we just can roll with it, right? We've got tools to help ourselves just keep going when the world doesn't go our way. But many kids have not yet uh, been given the tools, most of them have not been given the tools to help themselves when the world isn't going our way. And there are children who are triggered by 
everything, meaning when I don't get the seat I want on the bus, the world isn't going my way, I'm triggered, I go to my emotional state. It's I didn't get in the front of the line. It's someone didn't hold the door for me. It's someone bumped into me. It's I didn't get the the group I wanted. I didn't get to go to the playground. Like There are some kids who every little thing that happens feels like the whole world isn't going my way and they're triggered to their emotional state. So emotional state limits our ability to see from another person's point of view. We revert to disciplining the child the way we were disciplined as a child, even if we know that they're hurtful, that those are hurtful things, right? Even if we didn't like it when our parents said, um, I'll give you something to cry about, you know, or maybe we got spanked or maybe we got grounded or things taken away. Now, we kind of all logically know that stuff didn't really work. I mean, it might have scared us enough to stop us from doing something. But we didn't really learn anything other than to be scared, right? So we are parented in a certain way um, because our parents are doing the best that they can. And then that's it. That's our toolbox. Those are the skills that we have to deal with the kids that are in our care and in our homes. So when we're in our emotional state, we can't think of a better way to do anything. And this is when we find ourselves acting and saying the things that we said we've never said, okay? So emotional state asks one question, am I loved? Am I loved? And like, you might not think of yourself as loving, like having a deep feeling of love for the kids in your group, but this is like perceived love, right? You may not think that when you're in your emotional state, you're, feel, you're, you're asking yourself, am I loved by my boss? But for you, from your supervisor, love looks like support. It looks like answering when you call for help. It looks like... Um, you know, noticing when you are having a rough day and saying, hey, I, you know, what's going on, right? That's being loved. So it's not always like big beating heart love like we think about with our partners and our families. It's perceived, okay? So in the emotional state, when your kids are asking, am I loved? If we perceive the answer to be no, it's very likely we're going to stay in this state or we're going to tunnel right back down to the survival state and lose it even more, okay? So again, it's perceived. If we perceive the answer to be no, and when your kids are in their emotional state and asking you, am I loved? It's like they're asking, are you still going to like me when I act like this? Our answer should always be yes, right? We don't hold grudges against kids. Of course, we still care about them and like them even when they don't act the way we want to, or we should, right? If you don't, that's something to put a little time and thought into. But for the kids in your school age program, when they're saying, am I loved? It's because a behavior has happened or maybe someone else in the group has made them feel bad and has triggered a behavior and they need to feel accepted. They need to feel cared for, right? And so here's the time when we walk away and when we shut down and we give up, we're answering the question. And the question is no, right? Or the answer is no. Am I loved? Do you still care for me when I act this way? And we ignore it or yell at them unintentionally, of course. We are saying, no, I don't still care about you when you don't act the way I want you to. From your kids, the emotional state looks like yelling at you, ignoring your requests, blaming you or somebody else, back talk and sass, that's a trigger for us, right? Name calling, clinginess. So sometimes it's not being able to leave your side as emotional state. It's not always something coming out of their mouth. Um, and then you'll see it says here, attention seeking behaviors. So this is a whole other conversation, but attention seeking behaviors are really, they're not looking for attention, they're looking for connection. They're looking for, if I act this way, do you still care for me? And look, 
if I'm a kid coming into your care and I have had a terrible morning, uh, things were really rough at home, uh, our morning was really rushed, I got into a fight with my mom, my brother called me a name, my teacher made me feel bad. So it might not be something you're doing to make them feel like they're not loved. It can just be a feeling in general. And if they need you to answer it, they, they don't they can't just walk up to you and say, hey, I had a really rough day. Can I have a hug? Do you love me? Right? They don't do that. So what they do is, is any one of these things, right? They make a game of it. They're going to make you tell them whether they're safe and loved with you. So attention seeking is really connection seeking, right? If attention seeking or what you would look at as attention seeking. When you label something an attention seeking behavior, your instinct is to ignore it. If I don't give attention to it, I won't reinforce the fact that they're getting attention for it, they'll stop. That doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. If it did, you'd only have to do it a couple times. And on those rare occasions that it has worked, all that has happened is they have slid down to their survival state and they have shut down because they know you are not going to help them. Okay? So attention seeking behaviors need your attention. You give them the attention so that the behavior will stop. And then, this is a much longer conversation, but in the future, you give them the attention or the connection before they even have to ask for it. And those things stop happening altogether. Anyway, when you put two people in an emotional state together, look at this picture. It is yelling and fighting, right? So if a kid in your group is in emotional state and is sassing you um, and you're you know, thinking that that's disrespectful, then you get into your emotional state. This is it. Nobody's going anywhere. We've got a power struggle. Everybody feels bad. In an emotional state, the children cannot learn, they cannot problem solve, they cannot listen to reason, they cannot listen to us lecture them or threat, threaten them, right? They can't hear us say, um, what do you think your mom is going to say when she comes and picks you up and finds out about this? Or I'm going to call the director or you're not going to go on a field trip. It's not doing anything. Again, you might shove them back down into their survival state so they'll stop because they're scared. But all in all, they're not learning anything. You're not giving them a tool to do anything better next time, right? So a person in this state needs to know they are safe and loved. It's their only focus. It's the only thing they can put any resources towards. When we are in our emotional state, we cannot offer solutions, we cannot comfort them, we cannot stay quiet, we cannot download our calm. We have nothing to offer to make someone feel loved. In survival state, the bottom line is this, we cannot help the other person if we are not in the higher centers of our brain. They need us, we are the grown-ups, we are the ones in charge. They need us to be patient and download our calm, which means we need to stay calm. We need to notice and acknowledge their struggle, right? You seem upset, what's going on? Or maybe I know that this child didn't get, a, get to be a line leader and they're upset. So I'm going to breathe. I'm just going to say, so you were hoping that you got to be the line leader, but it's somebody else's turn. That's hard. You can handle this, right? And then give them some connection when they're ready for it. So the executive state, this is where we can problem solve and change our behaviors and make good choices and uh, learn new things and access all of the skills that we've been given. It attunes us to the feelings and experiences of others, right? So we talk about um, empathy. You need to be here to be empathetic to another person, right? Because when you're in your emotional or survival state, it's really hard to care about anybody else's feelings. So like as the leader, we need to really practice taking some breaths so that we can get ourselves all the way up here all the way up to our emotional state so we can help 
the children that are standing in front of us. When we're in our emotional state, we are free from past conditioning. It allows us to respond instead of react, right? Responding is taking a beat and thinking, how am I going to handle this? Reacting is an automatic built-in answer, right? The emotional state is where we realize we've had the power all along. I know what to do. I just couldn't think about it when I was in my emotional state. So I took a few breaths. Here I am right in the front of my brain. This is where it asks, what can I learn? In the executive state, there's problem solving and wisdom and unlimited skills and learning. And when you put two people in an executive state together, it's all good. They can learn and problem solve and listen to what you want to tell them. Right? So think about the arguments that happen in your group, or maybe this is your first time working with school agers, and, and maybe you just have to picture some of the arguments that happened you know, when you were younger with, with your peers. Think about the times that ha those things happen, and there's things that are upset, and we just want them to come get a teacher if someone is hurting your feelings, or this is what you say to someone if they take a toy from you, or a ball from you, or they, you know, butt in front of you in line. Here's how to handle it. When we're barking these things at them while they're upset, they can't hear it. They can't absorb it. And then we get frustrated because how many times have I told you when you need help, you need to ask me for it, right? It's because it's not, it's not getting in there. They need to be in their executive state. We need to get them calm first, then tell them what we want them to do next time. So they know like, hey, I am safe and this counselor's got my back. And next time this happens to me, they want me to come get them for help. It's more likely to happen. You're probably going to have to say it more than one time, but the older the child, the faster it might sink in for them. But you need them to be calm. And this goes against our instincts, right? Because when someone's acting the way we don't want them to, and we are triggered, we want them to pay for it. Right. And that might not be what we're thinking, but it's 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 what's happening. You know, we don't want to stay calm and help them calm down first because we want them to suffer for the way that they have just behaved. But in reality, really, that's sub that's you know, we're not even really making that decision. It's just kind of what's been ingrained in our brain. But now we're going to think about it for a second and make a decision like right now, decide when kids in your group don't act the way we want them to. Do you want them to suffer and pay or do you want them to learn a better way so that it stops happening? So if the answer was the first one, I want them to suffer and pay because that's what I had to do when I didn't, you know, do things right when I was growing up. If that's the answer, I encourage you to take a deep breath and and start to shift to the other side if that's the one you want to stick with that's okay too just like quietly like get up and just kind of sneak out right because it's going to be a miserable time for you working with these school age kids and it's going to be miserable for them too we don't want anybody to suffer not the kids and not you nobody needs to feel bad during summer camp or before and after school care. Doesn't need to be that way, right? So if we want children to learn a better way, we have to calm them down first. Then we can tell them what they need to do next time or why what they did was unsafe or why what they did is against our rules. When we are in our executive state, we can remember that, right? We can just download our calm and offer some solutions. We can comfort them. We can let them know, even though you didn't act the way I wanted you to, you're still good with me. I've still got you. I've still got your back. We can stay quiet and breathe. When we're in this state, we have something to offer other people. In survival state. Remember, when you are in survival state, all you have to offer the children in your care is, I will threaten you and I will hurt you. 
And while in many homes, these threats and hurt are very real and very painful, in our centers, it looks more like, um, I'm going to write you up. You're going to sit when we go to the playground. No one's going to want to play with you if you do that. I'm going to take away this. Go sit against the wall. Don't say another word, right? That's, that's threatening hurt. When we are in our emotional state, here's the skills that we have. I will blame you and I will abandon you. Look what you made me do. This whole group was having fun until you did it. You messed it up. I was having a great day until you just got into this huge fight and ruined it for everybody, right? Look what you made me do or abandon. This is a lot of times, you know, the group's ready to go. Someone's still having a hard time and we're like, I'm leaving. Bye. Bye. And we kind of creep out the door and make them think that they're literally abandoned and left behind, right? We try to scare them into complying with us. But that's all we have to offer when we're in our emotional state. In our executive state, we can say, I've got you. I'm here. Breathe with me. I'm going to keep you safe. Like, I'm the safekeeper. I've got your back. We can figure this out. How we handle these situations becomes a blueprint for all relationships and how they manage stress for the rest of their lives. Your job is so incredibly and overwhelmingly important when you come to work with these school-age kids every day because they are watching you handle things when the world isn't going your way and they are looking to you for problem solving. So if they see you lose your cool and threaten or take things away, then that's exactly how they're going to handle situations now and as an adult, unless someone gives them a better way, right? How you handle these situations becomes a blueprint for all relationships and how they manage stress for the rest of their lives. That's a big responsibility. So what now? Now, uh, again, you're not going to walk out of here with, we didn't give you any tools <laughs> to do things differently because that's a lot and it's, it's hard to handle. It gets overwhelming. And what happens when we get overwhelmed with information is we just flip that switch down and just go on and keep doing things the way we were doing them. So what you're going to do now is practice brain states. You know, when you see a child in front of you screaming at you, just think he's in his emotional state. He's asking, am I loved? He is looking to me to stay calm and let him know that even though he's upset, I've still got his back, right? Or the next time a child does something and you start you know, preaching or threatening, think, oh my gosh, I'm in my emotional state or I'm in my survival state. I need to like chill out for a second, walk away, take a few breaths and then come back to the situation. So we practice identifying those brain states. Composure gives you access to the higher centers of your brain. It helps you get them to theirs so that they can learn right? So you be the safe and trusted adult in their group. All of you be the safe and trusted adult that they need. Because here's the thing. Some of the kids that are in our care have trauma at home, right? The little teeny ones, the ones that are older, some of them have been through, through some really, really difficult stuff, some trauma, right? And trauma makes a mark inside us and that stays with us for like ever right and it manifests itself into all sorts of terrible things when we get older all it takes to turn that around is one consistent adult who knows how to stay in their executive state and who helps them if we want to teach them a better way, we need them to hear us. So we're going to take a breath, maintain our composure, and then we're going to help them. And by the way, you are going to mess up on this like a billion times. 
but here's the lesson that you can give your kids then. You handle a situation by losing your cool. You realize after, once you've gotten back to your executive state, like, man, I, I shouldn't have handled it like that. I got way too upset with the, this kid in my group. Go back to them and say, I wish I would have handled that differently. If I had been calmer, I would have said this to you. Apologize. That's hard. It's hard for all of us as adults to think about apologizing to anybody. It's because nobody did it to us when we were kids. So stop that cycle and apologize when you've handled things in a way that might have been hurtful. Teach them it's okay to apologize to their peers because probably if they've hurt someone, you're like making them go say you're sorry, right? How about teach them to apologize by showing them what a genuine apology looks like? You've got this. Until next time, I'm wishing you well. Good luck.